You're listening to the Turnaround Podcast, the true life basketball story of Bull City's own Stuart Squirt Holly. This podcast will take you on Holly's basketball journey from his start on the worn courts of the Walltown neighborhood in Durham, North Carolina, to the jailhouse and prison yards where he honed his skills, to his international professional basketball career in Lithuania, and back to his home state of North Carolina. Holly's brash delivery style and storied rise from a misguided juvenile offender to professional basketball player will captivate and lend insight into one Southern black boy's coming of age and how he became one of Bull City's favorite sons. My name is Stuart Doran Holly, better known to the world as Squirt. The nickname Squirt came from my grandma, my mother's mother. She said that when people used to try changing my diapers as a little baby, you know, I would just pee all over the place. <laughs> That's how the nickname Squirt came about. When my grandma said I could just piss all over everywhere. <laughs> I was born on a Tuesday, September 21st. 1976 in Chawan County, which is Edenton, North Carolina, which is a small town, northeastern North Carolina, out on the coast, what I like to call the country coast because it's, uh, it's in the country, but it's also on the coast. The people of that town are very reserved. They like things quiet, feel. They don't like a lot of change, you know, for the most part. The hard workers, because you got a lot of agriculture uh, up in Edenton. A lot of fishing goes on in Edenton, because again, like I said, we're out on the coast. Then you got what they call plant uh, up there, uh, where, where a lot of people find employment at these plants. Uh, so the people there are definitely, you know, hard working people. And uh, for the most part, up in Edenton, um, it's a small town, so you'll get, you know, a lot of close-knit uh, communities up in Edenton, you know, unlike the bigger cities. So it's not a lot of neighborhoods in Edenton, and what very few neighborhoods are in Edenton, as you drive by or as you walk through, or what most, a lot of people do is ride by, so it's, uh, everybody waves and speaks. So I'm born in that type of environment. So actually, my mom used to drop me off in Edenton like every summer when I was a kid and I would spend the summers up in Edenton trying to learn and get to know family members up in uh, what we call the E-Town. So uh, I definitely love going back home. A lot of people don't know about Edenton, never heard of Edenton. They don't know its location. So when I actually tell people that I was born in Edenton, they get shocked. Like, oh, okay, well, I thought she was born and raised in Durham. Yeah, I was raised in Durham when I was born in Edenton, Chuan County. Uh, Edetonian is what I am. Half Edetonian, half Durhamite. So my mom had me when she was a sophomore in college. She was around 18, 19. And she moved to Durham shortly after she graduated from Elizabeth City State University. From my understanding, my mom graduated college early. Uh, so it was around 78 when she moved to Durham. Maybe it couldn't have been no later than 79. So we been in Durham ever since about 78, 79. So because she told me I was around about two when she relocated to Durham and been in Durham pretty much ever since. So my earliest recollection and I can retract the information by going inside my mind. When my mom first moved to Durham, the first neighborhood she moved into, the neighborhood at that time was called Broadport. And uh, it's off of Highway 15501. So I remember being in that neighborhood back then. I was real young, so I have some memories, but not a lot because I was so young, like, you're talking three years old, four years old. But I do remember 
being out there and brawl more because uh, that's why I actually, my mom's taught me how to swing him, uh, learn how to ride a bike. Um, this was before my brother was even born. So when we was out in Broadmoor at the time, I remember a Darrow that was like a, a landmark. Uh, I always remember that Darrow that sat right there on the corner of um, 15501. Uh, and I forget the street that actually intersects with Highway 15501. But the people um, back then, like I was so young, uh, I don't really remember the people too much, you know, because I was very young. Uh, I did meet some young fellas out there who were a little older than I was and kind of find out they were actually relatives of mine. But at the time, we did not know that we were related. They was just moving down also out of New York uh, because a lot of my family members had migrated to New York. Like my grandmama, her sisters had migrated to New York. So uh, some of them had filtered from the south to up north and then made their way from up north back down to the south. So uh, like I said, I do remember my mom was teaching me how to swim back then. That's why I first learned how to ride a bicycle. And I wasn't even six years old yet, and I had already learned how to ride a bike and how to swim. Those are probably the most memories I have living in Broadmoor. So I was still innocent at that point in time in life. Probably for the for the most part, I was still innocent. I haven't quite yet been painted at that moment in time living in Broadmoor. So yeah, that's pretty much all I can remember. So it was just me, yeah, my mom, and uh the fella that she had relocated with to Durham with. And, uh, you know, I guess we'll get into that another time, how my mom ended up in Durham. <laughs> but, yeah, so that came her first cousin. So when my mom and, I guess, he was her boyfriend at the time, fiance at the time, because they didn't quite get married yet, we was in Broadmoor until uh, around, I would say, 82. And we moved to... The community of Wall Town. Durham might pretty much know where Wall Town is at. That's like almost central Durham. It's uh, very close to downtown Durham, Old North Durham. It's almost flat that dead in the middle of the Bull City. And my mom got married shortly afterwards because uh, she had my brother in like 82. So she had married his daddy. And Wall Town is kind of where things started to take drastic turns, not just in my life, but in my mama's life. And those turns actually is what shaped me into being the person that I am today. They were the catalyst for what was yet to come. So we moved to Walltown in the early part of the 80s. And Walltown was actually where I began to first experience and encounter bullying. Most of the kids in the neighborhood were my age. They had a lot of kids in the neighborhood who were older. And, uh, of course, it was the older kids who was doing the bully. Uh, at that time in my life, my mom would allow me, because I was old enough, or she would allow me to go down to the local park, which was like uh, a block over. Uh, if that, maybe half a block over the park. And it was a little small community center that sat right there in Walltown. So Walltown was good to me. And Walltown also was a place where I have a lot of memories, some good, some not so good. But I do feel like if it wasn't for Walltown, I don't know how I would have responded to future dilemmas that arose. And um, some of those dilemmas were actually, you know, just fighting. That seemed like a normal thing in the mid-80s. You know, a lot of fighting went on at that time. I first started getting into fights with other little kids, not just in, in Walltown, but the elementary school that I was going to, which was George Watt, still sets there to this day. But I think the name has changed. It's more like a magnet school now or something. Uh, but even had kids there that were into the bullying thing. I wasn't quite yet grown into myself, so I took a lot of beatings from kids. And um, actually, it wasn't until one day I was down at the park down in Walltown and kid, I don't remember the kid's name, but kid had beat me up. And I went home 
to my mom crying and she was in the kitchen doing some dishes and I come in the house crying. So she say, what's wrong with you? So I tell her, I said, well, little boy beat me up. So she stopped doing what she was doing immediately and, and told me, come on. So in my mind, I'm like, all right, well, I'm finna go down here and get this situation here handled. So uh, we just down to the park, bang the kids that were still out there and uh, she asked me which one was it. So I pointed to the little kid at that point, that's when she grabbed me and made me look her in her eyes. And she told me, either you go whoop his ass or I'm going to whoop your ass. And a switch went on inside my head. And uh, I looked at that kid and we fought. And I got the better end of the stick. And I never looked back. Going to school after that, and dealing with bullying, which continued, it seemed like after that moment in time when my mama walked me through the park and said, you better whoop his ass or I'm going to whoop your ass. After that moment in time, I started to get seasoned. And I almost welcomed the confrontations with the other kids. I didn't shy away from it after that at all. And I later in life learned what was inside of me that kind of took a liking to actually fighting other little kids. I learned later in life that my daddy was a professional boxer. He was a United States Army boxing champ who went undefeated. So it was in my DNA all the while. I just didn't know it. But like I said, something inside of me, once my mom triggered it, I took a likeness to it. And like I said, I just didn't shy away from it. Some ended up later in life is leading to another can of worms as I got older because you don't solve problems with your fist and or violence. But unfortunately, that's how I grew up in Walltown. It was either you fight or you get taken advantage of. And I was just that kid that I fought back with no fear. After my mom walked me to the park that day, like I said, it flipped on a switch that still to this day is on. It's kind of like when a lion would take the cub out for his first hunt and first kill, and that cub gets that first taste of that warm blood, you turn it on for the rest of your life. So it was certain kids in the neighborhood who ran together, and these guys in particular were uh, the bullying types. I remember these guys because at some point in time, I fought these guys pretty much almost every day and lost. Those were just two guys that I just could never get over the hump. We were all young, but they was just a little older. And but it was certain other little boys in the neighborhood that they were bullying also. And it seemed like we naturally kind of gravitated to each other and we became like best friends. And this was actually kind of funny because back then we used to watch this cartoon called The Thundercat. So one of the little homies, we kind of assimilated together and we even had this white guy with us. He was the only white boy in the neighborhood. And uh, we all pretty much ran together. And we actually nicknamed ourselves the Thundercat. And we protected each other. So it was kind of like good versus evil. We considered ourselves the good kids and they were the bad kids. And most of us are still friends to this day. All of them are still around. We actually still keep a contact. So you're talking about a friendship that goes back. 35 years ago, because we was uh, like real young, eight-ish, seven, maybe 10 at the oldest. To them, I was a leader. How, I don't know. I guess because I was just a little quicker to respond to the bullying than they were. And they looked at me like, well, he the big homie. We're going to follow his lead. It was just a mutual respect because we was experiencing some of the same things which was dealing with the bully. We went to different schools. That was the only thing. I don't know what school they was going to back then, but we was definitely going to different schools. I will say this as far as what type of reputation I had with those kids back then. If I was to come across any of those guys who did that bullying, I'm pretty confident that there is a respect level because I never ran from any of them. I stood my ground. And I never could beat either one of them. And I would see them coming. And I never ran. And I knew what was going to happen. 
they're coming to start trouble. All right, well, gonna hit this head up again. Back then, as far as kind of reputation, of course, they would say I was a little punk, but that's just how bullish thinking how they operate. But fast forward to the day, I feel like if I come across those individuals, yeah, it'll be a respect level because they know what well, he stood and fought. And though we beat him up, but he stood and fought. As far as the wall town goes, besides learning how to use my hands to protect myself, basketball was always present. Despite that, because of my life, said my mom would allow me to go to the park. And some of the older kids back then, my nickname was Dribble King. I guess because they say I used to always just dribble the basketball a lot. And of course, I was so young, they would not let me play with them. But at the same time, I run into some of those older guys and said, man, you was just dribbling that basketball, man, and he would try to get some of us to see we could take it from you, man. I was like, wow. So basketball was always ever present in my life because my mom said when I was about two, well, that's when I first picked up a basketball. So basketball was ever present. That was the reason why I would go down to the park. I could go play basketball because it wasn't any of us to play basketball in Broadmoor. So once we got in the wall time, it's part down there. That's how I started venturing out away from home. And then once you venture out away from home, you're not in or under the shelter and protection of your parents. I didn't have no older siblings, and my immediate family didn't live in Durham at that time. So I was by myself. So when I go to the park, and I ain't encountering these bullies and these older kids, try to take my basketball from me, things like that. I learned real quickly that, oh, hey, it's either you stand up for yourself or you get taken advantage of. And you don't want to be that kid that's always been ridiculed, teased, and taunted. And Wall Town is where all of those things started for me, uh, which was filtered into middle school. Same thing. Matter of fact, it just got even worse. Once I had gotten into the sixth grade at Broadway Middle School, it got even worse. That's where I first started to experience bullying in the school systems. That's about as early as I can remember. And a lot of people might not believe this. My high school friends and people that I met along the way in college, they might not believe it, but I was actually one of those kids who was bullied in school. And it started for me around sixth grade. So I was dealing with a lot of things at home also. My mom's first husband. I get a little bit more elaborate about some of that. And at the same time, I have to remember to be a little sensitive about what I say and how I say it. Because at the end of the day, that is my brother's daddy. So at the same time, uh, this gentleman moved on around about 2005. The thing about our schoolmates and our peers you never know what that person is dealing with at home. And as middle school kids, so none of my peers knew that I was going home to an abusive relationship. So my mom's first husband, he was abusive. And so dealing with that and then going to school and dealing with bullies and other kids who thought that it was cool for them to pick on me, put their hands on me, that helped shape my attitude and it helped shape my personality and the type of person that I am to this day, dealing with those type of adversities as a fifth and sixth grader. And the thing about it today is it still goes on to this day, bullying. And so, you know, fast forward to the 2000 era, you hear about kids, you know, committing suicide due to cyber bullying or just bullying itself. But the way I responded to it, was always fought back. And a few years earlier, my mom said, walk me outside and made me fight this young man that had pretty much beat me up. I could kind of say I was almost prepared for the bullying because I never shied away from it. I was a target, which I didn't like, but I fought back. And it wasn't always a good thing because then the school had to take disciplinary action. I got into a lot of trouble as a sixth grader. Looking back, my mindset, I was confused, hurt, really didn't know which way to go. And at that age, I was just like a regular kid. I just wanted to fit in, and I didn't necessarily fit in. Didn't have fancy clothes like some other kids. 
a lot of the girls at that time, they definitely teased me because of my wardrobe. They thought I was funny looking, skinny, big lips, and they used to always say that. I was told that I was ugly so much by the girls that I actually started to believe that. And that's how I felt. So that was my mindset, you know, and I didn't necessarily fit in. They actually placed me, and a lot of people don't know this either, but they actually placed me in a BEH class, which is short for Behaviorally Emotionally Handicapped, right? This was solely because of my home environment and what I was dealing with at home and then coming to school and dealing with this situation at school with these kids. So my mindset was I, I had nowhere to turn. That's just exactly how I felt. I didn't have nowhere to turn. And at that age, you really don't know how to express yourself. So not only did I not know where to turn, I didn't even know who to talk to or how to even go about explaining what I'm feeling on the inside. So yeah, those years were some very confusing and conflicting years for me. That time as a fifth or sixth grader, my mindset was just, I didn't know if I was coming or going. They thought that I was like uncontrollable in the classroom environment. So they thought that maybe it would be better to put me in a smaller classroom environment. To me, that just gave them extra ammunition, you know, extra fuel for the fire. Because, I mean, they seriously went in. And just because a kid is in a PEH classroom, I don't know if they still have that to this day. But for me, academics was never a problem. In fact, I always passed all of my classes, B's, A's. Very few classes I'd make a C. So academically, I was smarter than most of the kids. I wasn't a nerd or brainiac, but at that time, I even had intelligence and an intellect, even though I didn't know it. But the academics came easy for me. It was just that they thought that they it would be better to put me in a smaller, more controlled classroom. Every chance that we interacted, like some of the regular student body, from that time forward, it, it, you know, it was just almost like chaos because uh, all of us were targets. How the other kids dealt with it, I don't know, you know, but how I dealt with it was I lashed out. And that was solely because I was getting it from every which way I turned. Everywhere I turned, it was just some type of a physical confrontation. You got this situation over here where you got a grown man versus a little boy, right? So I came up on a short end stick of that every time. Then on this side over here, you got guys who want to pile up on you. And back then, guys would jump on you. All of those were tough to deal with at that age. This has been a Vanguard Podcast Network original. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Turnaround Podcast and follow the Turnaround Podcast on Instagram by hitting the link in the show notes. If you'd like to book Stuart Holly for a speaking engagement or to be a guest on your show, please reach out to theturnaround at gmail.com and someone will get back to you within 48 hours. Thank you for listening. Yo, man.